Joe, you should be unmuted. I believe I am. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Excellent. Okay. I'm just going to run through my introduction really quickly and we'll get started. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining Archibald Biological Station's first ever virtual Zoom seminar presented right here at Zoom. I'm Laura, your moderator for today. Each week, members of our staff and research program interns will give multimedia presentations and talks with the group. If you enjoy this live video event, we hope to see you back next Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Our presenter today, Joseph Gentili, has been the librarian at Archbold for the past two and a half years, preceded by the great Fred Lohr. In addition, Joe's worked to the archive, the Dr. James N. Lane collection at Archbold. He received his Master's of Library Science and Information Studies from the University of South Florida in 2013. He is also a member of the Highlands County Historic Preservation Commission, working with local individuals and the county government to preserve historic structures and locales. I have just a few pre-meeting points to go over before we get started. You already know we are keeping your mics muted. We're going to turn off your videos during the lecture. Feel free to use the chat function that we talked about earlier to comment or ask questions, and Joe will answer them after the lecture. Please be patient with us as this week marks our debut of live stream events and we are all still learning together. This event will be recorded and it'll be posted to our YouTube page for those of you who'd like to see it again or want to share it with friends. We expect it to last around 45 minutes with time added for questions at the end. So let's get started. If Joe would share his screen. I will indeed. Thank you very much, Laura, for that introduction. And uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, coming along today and uh, <clears throat> attending this talk. And there, okay. Um, so before we get started, uh, as Laura introduced me, my name is Joseph Gentili, um, but this talk would not be possible without the work of someone named Charlotte Wilson. Um, Charlotte is a colleague of Archbold's, and she spent over a year in the early 90s working on a manuscript about Hykoria. She went through county records, a variety of primary sources, including newspapers and other documents. And she actually interviewed multiple people who were either alive during the time period in question, or who were their children, or nieces and nephews and people who were alive. And in 1995, she created a fairly extensive manuscript, but it was never published. Um, so at various points, I'm going to directly cite her work, and I want to reiterate that um, everything that she did is integral to the talk that you're about to hear. So I'm going to talk to you about Hycoria's history in four parts. Um, the first is a very brief background about Highlands County history. And if you were to come to the area that is now Highlands County 100 years ago in 1920, you would actually be in DeSoto County. For those of you who are familiar with the geography of the area now, there is a current DeSoto County. Um, it comprises about one-fifth of what the original DeSoto was. And in 1920, about 25,000 people lived in this county. As you can see, uh, according to the official 1920 U.S. Census, there's a listing of population levels by precinct. There are five towns specifically listed that are in the future Highlands County, and combined they have nearly 4,000 people. But when you look at what this DeSoto County was like, it's a really large entity. Um, it's nearly 4,000 square miles, so more than twice the size of the state of Delaware. And in 1920 and 21, the state of transportation in the area was relatively primitive. The road situation was nowhere near what it is now and trains did not run throughout the entire area. So if you look at the map to the left of DeSoto County, it extends all the way from Lake Okeechobee to Charlotte Harbor, nearly the Gulf of Mexico, east to west, and from Bowling Green to what is now Moorhaven, north to south. So a truly large area. So if you were to live in perhaps Venus or in Fort Basinger or one of the other areas in the eastern part of the county, a trip to the county seat would have been quite uh, an endeavor, possibly taking over a day. And why does that matter? Well, because during this time period, if you were to apply for a birth certificate or a marriage license, if you wanted to vote, if you wanted to do any number of things that we take somewhat for granted in their ease now, you had to take a physical trip to Arcadia, located all the way at the western border of the county almost. 
So as you can imagine for the people in what would become Highlands and also Glades County specifically, um, this setup was not ideal. So they decided to attempt to have the county split by the state legislature. And on April 23rd, 1921, the Florida State Le Legislature did exactly that. Um, for some context about how large that original DeSoto County was, it includes all five of the counties that you see listed. Hardy, DeSoto, Charlotte, Glades, and Highlands. And so again, for someone in Highlands County, now when you wanna conduct normal everyday government business, it's a much simpler endeavor than traveling all the way to Arcadia. But when you create a new county, you need to create a county seat. And as you can see on this map, Sebring is the county seat of Highlands. Um, but it didn't necessarily have to be. And why did I bring up this early Highlands County history for a Hycoria talk? It turns out that Hycoria actually had an influence in the fact that Sebring is the county seat. So in 1922, four different towns attempted to be the county seat. Um, and Sebring and Avon Park were the front runners because of their population. And if you look at this map on the right, it's a little bit past the time period we're discussing, but it shows you a good layout of Highlands County. If you lived in Hycoria or Lake Placid or in the eastern part of the county, getting to Sebring was physically much easier than getting to Avon Park would have been. So when the election took place, 96.8% of all the county's eligible voters voted. That is a uh, state record supposedly for a county election. And Sebring and Avon Park's votes in essence canceled each other out because they had very similar populations, but 351 votes were cast from other municipalities. And 78% of those votes went to Sebring. So if you live in Highlands County currently and you conduct official government business in Sebring, at least in part, you can thank the residents of Southern Highlands County who voted overwhelmingly to have the seat be there. And the photo you see below is a building called the Haynes Building. If you were to go to the courthouse when Highlands County was brand new, that is where you would have went because the courthouse in Sebring was not built yet. So even before there was a Highlands County, Hycoria was already uh, important to this area. I wanna dig a little bit deeper now into the town itself and its foundings. In 1881, the Florida legislature created an entity called the Atlantic and Gulf Coast Canal and Okeechobee Land Company. And what you're looking at is an official map from the pamphlet the company created. They owned the vast majority of the land that you can see in both dark pink and light pink. And on the right, I have just zoomed in into the map to show you a little bit more of the area we're talking about. In the 1880s, this area would not have even been DeSoto County, it was Manatee County. And you can see the large red arrow is where Hycoria would end up being in a few years. This is what the pamphlet looks like, and that copy is from the University of Central Florida Digital Library. <clears throat> it's an original copy. So 50 years after the county was founded, there was a golden jubilee program given out to citizens for 50 cents and part of the goal was to teach you about the history of all of the towns in highlands county and hycoria had a two-page section written about it and for the our purposes there are two interesting facts the first is that the first settler and they even referenced the person as a squatter was about 1894 or 1895 so people were living in the Hycoria area even before 1900, though in very few numbers. <clears throat> and also, it references how Hycoria got its name. Uh, Dr. John Kunkel Small, a very well-known botanist, came to this part of Florida uh, several times to work on a book called Flora of the Southeastern United States. Um, and while in this area, he took a special interest in a hickory known as Hycoria floridana or the scrub hickory. And he suggested as the railroad was being built through the area that they should name the railroad station Hycoria. And that is in fact why it got its name. If you were to come here about that time, 1915 to 1917, you would have seen five or six original homesteads there was a government survey, resurvey issued in 1917, and according to those official records, five families currently lived in Hycoria. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm going to reference work done by Charlotte Wilson frequently, including now. She went and 
go, went through some plat book maps of the old area. And these, so these are rough maps of the area of Hykoria and the dates of the original landowners. And you can see on the right, I've zoomed in a little bit into the Hykoria area specifically. The four highlighted homesteads and the one next to James Carlton were where the five original homesteaders lived. It was actually not um, the Hammers that lived there, it was the Shacklefords. Um, but these five families are sort of the genesis of what will become Hycoria. And if you notice, land in their area is owned by the canal company and also by the railroad. And if you look along what is marked Atlantic Coastline Railroad, there's a date of 1917. Between 1915 and 1918, so roughly during World War I era, the Atlantic Coastline Railroad surveyed the area. And during the 20s, which were a real population boom in Florida, they expanded railroad service throughout Southwest Florida. On the left, you can see an official map of some of their lines. And on the right, I've zoomed in a little bit so that you can get a better idea. And you can see that the line runs from Lake Wales through Avon Park and Sebring down to High Coria and past. But it's important to note that this is not a passenger line. This is more for cargo. But it did open up the town to the wider world in two important ways. The number one being mail is now delivered by train. So goods and letters from the outside world became much easier to both send and receive. <clears throat> How do we know some of what we know about Hycoria besides from these official documents? Well, it turns out the area was fairly well reported on by the local newspapers of the time. So to your left, there's a newspaper called the Sebring White Way. And to your right is a uh, Highlands County News article. And they're fairly mundane items, for instance, about um, someone returning from surgery in Arcadia, or how a man named G.A. Kelsey became the teacher at the Lake Placid School. Um, but for locals, this was an important way to keep up with what was going on in the community. And in Charlotte's research, not only did she uncover some of these newspaper articles, um, but she actually spoke with individuals. So she spoke with someone named Vernell Raleigh, who was a Hycoria resident. This is a picture of Vernell on the left in 1926. And she spoke with family members of George Kelsey, the teacher from the newspaper article in the last slide. And that's a photo from him in the 1920s. He taught at the High Courier School for about five years to several dozen students. <clears throat> so in these interviews, Charlotte asked them about what life was like in the early days of High Courier. And Horace Shackelford mentioned to her that there were so many quail that you could go out and fill up your hunting coat without a dog. And Vernell Raleigh mentioned that many homesteaders canned a great deal of garden vegetables and fruit they collected. She even remembered one season where they canned over 600 containers of produce. Similarly, Mary Kelsey Payne, a family member of George Kelsey, remembers that the early days were raw, in her words. There were sightings of panthers and bobcats and bears, common even, she says, with foxes stealing chickens. And Horace Shackelford, again, mentions Seminole Indians were seen fairly regularly, as well as illegal fur traders looking for whiskey. <clears throat> so it was a sort of slow paced homestead town throughout most of the 1920s. But that is gonna change quite drastically in 1929. And the reason why has to do with turpentine and timber. For the purposes of Hycoria specifically, turpentine will be less of the story than timber is, but in Highlands County in general, turpentine was very important to the early years of the 20th century. In what is today the Avon Park Air Force Range in the northern part of Highlands County, there used to be a town called Nalaka. And this in the next slide, I reference the town of Nalaka for a very specific reason. <clears throat> um, it existed in the 1920s for only about six to 10 years, but it was associated with a company called the Consolidated Naval Stores, who was involved in turpentining and then logging lumber. Consolidated Naval Stores is a subsidiary of a company called W.C. Sherman, and they operate a large mill in High Korea, which we will discuss next. Nalaka, before it was dismantled, <clears throat> Um, lasted about 10 years, as I mentioned, and it was literally dismantled and uprooted. 
because that was the way of how turpentining and lumber went. Once you had removed enough pine from an area, it was time to take the whole apparatus somewhere else. But the interesting part from this article is that part of the turpentine operation was disassembled in April 1929 and moved to High Corinth. If you're interested in learning more about turpentine and lumber along the Lake Wales Ridge and in Polk and Northern Highlands County, this book, Turpentine, Citrus, Lumber, and Cattle, is a great resource, and we have it in the Archbold Library. As I mentioned, turpentine is not as big a factor in Hycoria specifically, but when the mill was announced by the Sherman Mill Company in the official newspaper item, it does mention that they will all also operate turpentine stills. But on October 19, 1928, the residents of Hycoria, about 150 of them at this point, got this news in their newspaper that a very large mill was going to show up in town. And if you look closely, it actually says it's going to be built in only 60 days. So imagine if you were living in a sort of edge of the rural area community of just several dozen people, and now a very large logging operation that's going to employ hundreds of people is coming to your town. And this is what this mill possibly would have looked like. This is a Sherman sawmill. Sherman operated a mill in a town called Sherman, as well as Hycoria, near Okeechobee. After speaking with the curator of the Cracker Trail Museum, where this photo is from, it's unclear if this mill is from Hycoria or from Sherman. But it is a Sherman Company mill, and it's indicative of what you would have had in Hycoria. A colleague of Archbold's named Bill Parkin went out to the Hycoria area and built a story map in part using GIS coordinates that he had acquired on the ground. So what you're looking at here is a map that Bill created of structures at the site of Hycoria now. And were you to go out to Hycoria now, there is no evidence of homes or homesteads or what have you, but there are concrete remnants of the mill's base. And Bill mapped out several dozen of these, as you can see, and he even laid out a possible outline for the mill building in pink. To give you some sense, the area contained in there is over the size of a football field. <clears throat> and so how did Bill do this? He went out with a GPS unit and tagged locations of items like what you see here. This is a small concrete pyramid that was almost certainly a support structure of some sort. And so he built these images by mapping all of these individual pyramids and footers. And then he superimposed this image over a current aerial photograph of the area. So as you can see, the mill was probably 300 or so feet from the railroad. And this is important because moving lumber to the mill by rail and then moving the cut lumber out by rail as well was important. How much of an impact did this have on the town of Hycoria? Well, in 1920, there's no official census data for the town, but it seems like there were about 125 people. In 1930, barely a year after the mill opened officially, there are 587 residents in Hycoria. So that's a 500% population increase, possibly, because hundreds of jobs were created overnight. Now, this doesn't all come with positives as a change this large, you would imagine. There are three major negatives associated with the mill and what it brings. The first is a really restricted wage policy. Because Sherman owned a large mill in Sherman and Hycoria, they were able to dictate wages for laborers in the logging industry in this area. And they were investigated by the federal government as a result by the um, labor department. And although it was found they weren't doing anything illegal, it was found that they were controlling wages and artificially suppressing them. And along with this also came a company store. And if any of you are familiar with company stores, they usually are not beneficial to the employee. So at least some of these workers' pay was in script to the company store. And one of the main ways to acquire goods was through this store. And below you can see an actual um, R10 lumber store token from Hycoria, which uh, was found through a coin collecting website in a private collection. 
The second associated danger affected everyone in the area, not just mill workers, and that is the ever-present danger of fire. Due to the nature of the work going on, and especially the use of large steam boilers, fires were very frequent. The mill existed between 1929 and 1935, and there were a minimum of three large fires. And the one referenced in this slide in 1935 actually did approximately a million dollars of damage in today's money. <clears throat> the third negative that comes is the inherent destruction and deforestation which turpentining and logging bring to an area. During Charlotte's research, she discovered that the Sherman Company throughout Florida probably cleared almost a million acres of Florida, and none was ever replanted. And W.C. Sherman himself in the 50s was interviewed, and he gave this quote below that I'm going to quote in some detail. He said, I am just one of the thousands throughout these United States who thought only in terms of the vastness of our country, who marveled at the apparently unlimited supply of natural resources. But we were short-sighted. No man has the moral right to devastate natural resources, which might be needed by future generations. So along those lines, I want to talk about what is the connection to Archbold Biological Station and why is this talk given through Archbold? Well, in 1929, when the mill was being built, John Augustus Roebling II and his wife, Margaret Shippen Roebling, were wintering in Highlands County. They had actually spent multiple winters here as a guest of Melville Dewey, he of the Dewey Decimal System fame. Melville Dewey built a sort of southern retreat in Lake Placid, Florida, and Margaret and John wintered at the retreat for at least two winters. Margaret was a surf sufferer of tuberculosis, and the medical wisdom of that time was that the warm, dry air in Florida was good for tuberculosis. So they decided to start wintering in Florida. After two seasons at the lodge, John decided to acquire property in what was then Hycoria. And what he acquired, then known as the Red Hill Estate, was the original grounds of Archbold Biological Station. He, his personal and family architect and engineer was a man named Alexander Blair. Alexander Blair is a very interesting individual who has his hands in a variety of Highlands County history. He actually lived to be almost 100 into the 1970s. And he donated a variety of materials to Archbold's archive at that time. So a lot of what we know about the early building of the grounds before Mr. Archbold's arrival comes from Alexander Blair. And this is a photo of him from 1932. And Mr. Roebling didn't just bring his resources to this area, he brought jobs to this area. 1929 is the beginning of the Great Depression. And instead of using modern techniques and technologies to build the original Archbold Station grounds, he hired dozens of local laborers to do as much as possible by hand. So I just wanted to show you a little bit um, from 1933 on the left and from 1931 on the right of the buildings being built. And you can imagine people who are living just a couple miles down the road in Hycoria who have no other source of income. This would have been amazing. And he paid three dollars to five dollars a day depending on your skill level which was fairly generous for depression wages but more than that it was about having guaranteed income and the ability to feed your family margaret and john had a son named donald and unfortunately margaret died in 1930 of tuberculosis complications john decided to complete the building of the grounds and work was continued from 1930 until 1935. So 1935 is sort of the beginning of the end of Hycoria. The mill fire in June expedited the closing of the mill, and Mr. Roebling was no longer employing laborers to build his grounds. So for the next five to six years, John Roebling tried to find someone to acquire the grounds, and it turned out that his son Donald's school friend, Richard Archbold, was looking for a place to have sort of a base camp for his biological expeditions. And so Donald got his father and Richard Archbold together. And in 1941, Mr. Archbold acquired the grounds from John Roebling. If you look at a modern map 
of Archbold Biological Station's grounds, which are in approximately in green in the slide you see, you'll notice that today, the grounds of the Sherman Mill, and indeed almost all of the grounds of Icoria, are contained within the Ar Archbold Biological Station. And the purchasing of these grounds began before Mr. Archibald's death in 1976. They actually began in 1973. And through a series of transactions over the ensuing decades, nearly all of what was Hycoria is now a part of Archibald Biological Station. So that explains what happened to the land. What happened to the people? Well, uh, Fred Lohr, as mentioned at the beginning of this talk, our librarian emeritus, was our longtime librarian here for nearly five decades, and Fred and I have had multiple conversations about Icoria. So I asked him if Mr. Archibald had kept any residents on the payroll after he came in 1941, and it turns out he probably did hire, uh, excuse me, keep four people, and he certainly did keep Garvin Shackelford, who we briefly touched upon earlier as a Icoria resident. He worked here at Archibald Biological Station um, during the 1940s and possibly the 50s. And all four of these people listed may have been kept on the payroll by Mr. Archibald as well. So some few Hycoria residents still found employment here. But between World War II and the um, mill fire, Hycoria's population plummeted. By 1950, it's down to below 150 people. So I have been discussing this with Fred, the precipitous decline of population and what that leads to. And he had a really great quote, which was that Hycoria was in a thermal lumber town. Lots of buildings were probably abandoned or burned in a wildfire. Um, but when he came in 1970s, there was one building still left. And I was hoping to find the slide that he mentioned and tie the talk up with that and show you that. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to. But the point that I want to drive home is that the mill's role in Hycoria precipitated boom and bust both. It was an artificial rise in population that could not be sustained. And once the mill left, the town itself crumbled. By the 1950s, there was no longer a post office, which is a surefire sign that a town is on the decline. And by the 60s, at the latest, no one lived there any longer. So just to give you a brief sense of what it looks like out there now, while Bill was working on his GIS story map project, he took this great photo that shows you a fairly large concrete pyramid, it's bigger than he is almost. And Jen Brown, a colleague of Archbold's, took these photos five or six years ago to show you some of the other concrete remnants. The large footer on the right that's Bill, uh, Bert Crawford, our operations manager. And to give you a sense of how large that is, it clearly dwarfs him. <clears throat> so that is our talk for today. I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to especially thank Charlotte Wilson. As I mentioned, this would be impossible without the incredible amount of work that she put in. Um, and although her manuscript is unpublished, we do have Let's give Joe a few minutes to get back on track here. If anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat box. So we'll be ready for him. Or we can unmute you in just a moment if we're able to get Joe back. Yep, it looks like Joe has left us for now. I'm going to wait a few, just a minute and see if he can log back on. All right, I'm going to unmute everyone. And maybe we can have our executive director, Dr. Hillary Swain, give a few more interesting points. Just got to talk to everyone. Uh, Joe's computer oh, no. crashed, so he's being set up. Oh, no. Computer crash. Damn these things. You're not muted anymore. Oh, it's gonna be constant.
We have a question. Laura, Laura, it's Hillary here. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you'd like to point some of them from for me. Great, thank you. I see that Joe's trying to log back in, but let's see. And I see that Bill Smith asked Hillary if there is a display of artifacts at Hycoria at Archbold from Hycoria. Uh, no, there is not. And that's a very good question. In fact, we haven't really had an in-depth archaeological survey. It is definitely on our to-do list. It's not quite got the top of it and we'd need to look for some extra funding to bring in some professional um, archaeologists and historians, but we'd love to do it. And uh, if you have any ideas about that, please let us know. And Laura, Joe is back on, if you can unmute him. Yep, let me find him. And say Joe's PC. There it is. Hello? You're back. Oh, oh I'm is. really sorry about that. Um, <laughs> my laptop decided to restart during the last slide, but I had everything open on my desktop just in case. <laughs> um, so I'm here audio, but no video. I apologize, everyone. Joe, there's a question. Do you have a better aerial on location of the mill from Nancy Bassett? Of the exact location of the mill? So it was to the west of where the road, it, Old State Road 8 runs now and fairly close to the road. Bill's outline is a guess, but it seems to um, gel fairly well with where it would have been. So I believe that what he had in the slide, I, I can load that slide up again, is pretty close to where it would have been. Um, part of the problem is that there are sort of associated structures with the mill as well. So it's kind of hard to figure out what would have been a permanent structure and what would have been sort of, um, can you let me share my screen? I can put the talk back up again. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm going to make you co-host again. That should help. Okay. Yeah. It's because I had to switch computers. Sorry again, yeah. everyone. <clears throat> So we have a question from Dustin, is Hycoria now Venus? No, and that's actually an interesting aside to this, which is something I really would like to dig deeper into along with the uh, Historic Preservation Commission that Laura mentioned. Venus predates not only Hycoria, but most of this area. Venus is an official census designation before Sebring even existed. And its population never seemed to have cratered. Um, when I was doing the census research for this talk, I dug really deep in 1920 through 1950. And Venus's population didn't have the spike that lots of other areas did, but it also didn't have the decline afterwards. And I'm really interested to know what the factors driving that were and how it's been able to continue in a way that other communities in this area were not. All right, I have a couple more here. Sure. From Juan, we have, is Hycoria no longer a town at all, or is there any sort of remaining activity? And um, also, so, when you're, also, when you're done, uh, Dr. Fitzpatrick is on, the, is on the line, Executive Director at Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and he'll answer a couple of those questions too. Sure. Yeah. Um, if, if he'd like to go now, th sure. Um, that would be great. Let me find him so I can absolutely. unmute him. Uh, whoops, there. I'm unmuted. There. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so first of all, Joe, absolutely terrific presentation. Really well done, organized, presented. Love it. You've got a, you've got a, a new career in the making here. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, over the uh, decades that we've been studying the Florida scrub jay, we've uh, regularly found uh, the, the aluminum uh, turpentine pans that uh, were placed underneath the pine trees. And a few of those turpentine pans are sitting as artifacts in the, uh, in the bird lab. Um, there is one tree left that I know of in the entire Archbold property that still shows the cat face um, slashes uh, that were uh, put on the base of the tree to 
uh, to take in to to, uh, to cause the turpent the uh, pitch to run into the turpentine pans out there at the very west end of Culvert Road. I'd love to know from the people that are uh, moving around Archbold uh, property whether you ever find any more, but there is still that one that's sort of fossilized uh, snag that has the cat face tree that shows the Icoria era um, uh, behavior of the turpentine harvesting folks. Uh, two other quick comments. Um, uh, during the 1990s, uh, while we were at Lake Annie one afternoon on a Saturday, an elderly uh, gentleman came into the Lake Annie property and said, I learned to swim in this lake. Um, so there were uh, there are lots of people who had fond memories of, uh, of the importance of that region. And my final comment is, I'm it's really worth our while to try to get a hold of, and I, I might uh, volunteer to do this, uh, Chet and Marcia Weingarner, who were longtime employees of Archbold. And they, they have the last of the railroad signs for the Hycoria Railroad stop. And uh, I've long died to have the, that, that sign uh, back down there at Archbold. So, um, this your talk, Joe, makes me uh, double down on trying to make sure we can uh, talk them out of that sign. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'd like to add a little onto the um, the area where the um, mill was largely harvesting. The uh, consolidated the um, naval store company did do a survey. A, a tree survey, a tree um, in 1920 by a surveyor called uh, A.E. Little. And we do have maps of the density of trees in the area around Hycoria. And most of the significant timber was well to the west of where Hycoria was. That's why they ran the single track railroad lines out to the west. It was on the west slopes of the Lake Wills Ridge. Um, if you read his rather disparaging remarks about the quality of the timber around Hycoria and to the east, it was sort of described as third rate and straggly. So much of the major timber was along the western slopes of the ridge. And Bert Crawford, who lives here, describes his father actually doing lumbering on that uh, sort of western slope of the ridge, not as part of the mill, separate from that, but that was where the significant timber, uh, timber holdings were to be found. Um, the other thing to notice is just what High Korea Station actually looked like. Usually the railroad owned 65 feet on each side of the main line. At those stations, they owned 120 feet wide. And we should probably add that into any of the maps. So you can see um, this is still owned by the, you know, the modern railroad still operates that area. So the station was a long stretch with a double the normal width of um, sort of holdings on each side of the line. All right, do we have any other questions in the chat? We had one question from Ken about hickory being the dominant tree in the area, but our plant lab expert, Dr. Mingus, answered that. Hickory is very common in that area today. If, if anyone would like to talk about that, was hickory the predominant tree in the area? I did see a question about the black community at Hycoria. Um, the mill had segregated housing, white housing and black housing, and there were many black employees. And there is a town in the, it's unincorporated, but it's known as Highway Park. And the cemetery that Hillary referenced in the chat is in Highway Park. And through our work with the Historic Preservation Commission, um, that's actually come up recently and is up for a spot on the National Register of Historic Places. And it seems like it's going to get it. Um, so that will actually only be Highlands County's fourth place on the registry, and Archibald's one of the three. <clears throat> All right, we have another question from Steve. Was pine the primary species harvested for the mill? 
Yes. All right. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Can I just jump in verbally here? Of course. Um, Fitz again here. This is. Uh, I'm just wondering um, for the benefit of the of a bunch of people that are listening who might not uh, know about it. I was just wondering. I'll put Eric Mengus on the spot. Can you tell us a little bit about that that Hycoria Floridana, the scrub hickory, after which the town was named? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, here we go. Yes. We can. Yeah, uh, I can't see my face, so I don't know if I'm looking, but uh, yeah, Hikori Floridana is uh, uh, very common on the yellow sands uh, throughout Florida and it's in the southeast coastal plain. It's a very important wildlife food um, for a lot of animals, and it's, uh, it's an interesting tree because it's deciduous. So most of the shrubs and trees in our area um, are evergreen and high, for some reason, probably based on its, its evolving in temperate areas. It turns color, provides us with some of our fall color, it drops its leaves for a month or two in the winter. So uh, it's, uh, it's possible with that if you're flying over areas in the winter, you can uh, see very well the distribution of Hycora uh, hickory in the landscape. Uh, the, the current name, I believe, is Caria Floridana. So the name has been changed from Hycoria, but the way plant names go, it may well change back uh, in a few years. If anyone is, this is Hilary Swain here, if anyone is interested, some of the specimens that John Kunkel Small collected, uh, he worked for the New York Bot Botanical Garden and was sponsored um, to do a lot of work in this area. Um, some of the specimens that he collected for um, the, the scrub hickory are actually online in the New York Botanical Garden collections and you can see where he collected them. So that's kind of a nice, a nice piece of uh, digital information and preserved pl uh, pressed plant specimens that you can see online. All right, we have a question here from Dave. Dave was wondering if Fish Eating Creek gave Venus a different basis for its economy than turpentine, maybe through farming? Uh, that is something, as I mentioned to Dustin's question, that I would like to dig a little bit deeper into. There has to be a reason why Venus was able to keep relatively steady population numbers while the area around it didn't. Um, but I am not versed enough in Venus history to answer that definitively. That is a project that we would like to work on going forward, though. Um, so hopefully in the near future, that's something we'll be able to answer. It really is, to me at least, interesting to see how Venus has been resistant to the changing demographics of the area around it. And I would really like to learn more about what. Okay, I don't see any other questions. If I missed anything, let me know. There's a question from Ray White there, Laura, wondering if Venus is actually a town now. It is indeed, yes. <laughs> Molly and I used to go down it's and where Archibald was actually located. Is Venus still a, a, a voting, a, a polling center? Uh, that that's I'm... where I vote, John. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, Joe, that's where I, I live in Venus and that's where I vote. All right, I'm just going to share my screen, my last screen here. Get rid of the chat in front of it. That's Joe's last slide that we didn't get to see. Yeah, sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> at, at least it waited till the next to last slide. I appreciate that. So if, if we want to wrap up now, I'll just tell everyone that we do have two events again next week. 
We have Archbold's Discovery Classroom on Tuesday with Dustin Angel, who's here representing our group today. And also, actually, Thursday is also with Dustin Angel, our next staff seminar on Thursday at 3.30, Archbold, why, what we do and why it matters. And I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming and thank everyone who made this talk possible. That part got cut off, unfortunately. I appreciate it very much. And I hope that it was informative to everyone. I'd like to personally, this is Hilary Swain here. I'd like to personally thank you, Jill, for putting together a, a very tight talk there. And also to thank the team behind. I know these things are not trivial to do, so we appreciate it. And um, uh, thank all of you for joining us. It's just really, um, we're sorry you can't be here, but we're glad we can bring a little bit of Archful to you. So thank you all very much for joining us. We appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. I think you can close the meeting, Laura. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Maybe I